holy cow, somebody is doing to us what we were training our soldiers to do eight years ago to other, other nations. And I mean, the, the point is they haven't learned the lessons yet, have they? No. Because, I mean, <laughs> you could literally shut down a military base like that. And so when I saw this... So Neil, you, you mentioned this treatment plant in, plant in Florida, and um, I've heard some rumors that it had like team viewer or something, mm -hmm. something happened. Can you talk a little bit about that so we have another real world example of something that happened really recently? And you know, what did they do wrong? What's your advice? What can we learn from this? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the, the bluff or the bottom line up front, right, is there was a, um, it was a water treatment facility plant in Florida. Um, and, and don't let me forget, David, but I have, an, I have a cool, awesome NSA story to, to tell about this one as well. So, so I, I need to make sure I tell this. One. But there was a water treatment facility plant in, um, in Florida that um, the, the, the plant operator was at work one day and looked over onto their computer that they had in the office and noticed the mouse moving erratically across the screen. Um, at first, he didn't think anything of it because they have a procedure set up that the, the manager um, remotes into that box frequently to check on things in the plant and to use that box remotely. Um, and so he didn't think anything of it because he thought it was the manager who was rem remote remoting into that box to control it. Well, a little while later, he noticed the mouse was still moving. And this time it was actually changing some of the um, chemical control values um, and the water treatment facility plant specifically, I think it was the, the um, I, I'd have to check and see which specific chemical it was increasing, but it was changing it to something like 11 parts per million to like, you know, 11,000 parts per million. And what that would have done effectively is over the course of the next 24 to 36 hours is it would have caused, you know, a level of poisoning um, to the community that it supported um, uh, you know, you know, in that regard, and what it ultimately ended up fi finding out was, um, it was a publicly facing team viewer, you know, you know, computer where they had, they had easily accessible passwords where they had gotten access to that computer via team viewer. Um, and they had just started, you know, Hey, what does this do? You know, sort of thing when they get, gained access to it. Now, in this particular case, it didn't end up being part of a nation state attack. But and this is this is a story that I like to tell. And it was it was super surreal for me to read about this story because um, during my last few years in the Air Force, we were helping to build um, the first cyber training unit in the Air Force. Um, and there's a video on my um, on my LinkedIn um, and, and I can get you the link for that that talks about the making of a cyber warrior. Um, actually, I think you've seen that video. Yeah. Um, and, and that's the training school that we were building, um, you know, to, to train the next ne next generation of offensive uh, cyber warriors. Um, when we were standing up that school, we were heavily focused at the time. And one of my specialties was doing um, SCADA and industrial control system offensive hacking. Um, cool stories to tell about things like hacking surface to air missiles. Um, I could tell lots of cool stories about that maybe for a different time. Um, but one of the things that we had done was we had worked out a partnership with the local water treatment facility plant and the local power plant. We told them that we were teaching cyber defense. And um, what we were really doing was we were going to those organizations to see how those organizations worked so that we could think about what a cyber war would look like if we were to target water treatment facility plants and power plants and things like that. Um, and so long story short, um, you know, we go into this organization, this water treatment facility plant, and they explain how water treatment facility plants work and all the chemicals and the science and everything else that's involved in that. Um, and then they take us into their office and it's, you know, it's not a glamorous office. It's like literally a one room type of office scenario and sitting right there on the desk is a computer running windows XP, um, you know, on, on a, on a very, very like 15 inch CRT style monitor, you know, that, that they still had. <laughs> and, um, you know, there was no password on it. it. It, it, the desktop looked like, you know, if you go to your grandmother's house and you see like, you know, 9,000 icons on their desktop, you know, sort of thing. 
Um, and that one of the big windows that they had up there was a window that said uh, your antivirus was like a thousand days out of expiry, you know, from an, an antivirus definition perspective. And so we asked them, we were like, so what do you use this computer for? And they were like, um, well, we, we, we obviously use it to, to surf the Internet through the day, but also it controls all of the um, um, all of the regulators for all the chemicals that you would put into the water treatment facility plant day in and day out. And we were like, who has access to this? And they're like, well, everybody who's here has access to it. You, if you're in this room, you could literally sit down at this computer and you can control everything in the water treatment facility plant. And they were using, um, um, you know, a team viewer type application at that um, water treatment facility plant, um, you know, for a lot of the same reasons. And this was back in 2000 and 2011, 2012. So, so, you know, mere, mere eight years ago that this was going on. Um, and what the impact was, I, I say all this to talk about the cyber war implications, right? This was a water treatment facility plant that serviced an air base of, you know, 50 to a hundred thousand, you know, service members. That was a special operations base. They were doing, you know, special operations work. We obviously had cyber operations that we were doing at that base as well. They were doing a ton of intelligence work. And if you could imagine, you know, that changing the chemical makeup of the water poisoned an entire community, you could legitimately shut down a military base by just simply hacking into a water treatment facility plant, changing the water, making everybody sick, and then nobody shows up to work at the, at the base the next day. You could literally shut down a military base like that. And so when I saw this water treatment facility plant in Florida, that's instantly where my head went was, holy cow, somebody is doing to us what we were training our soldiers to do eight years ago to other, other nations. And I mean, the, the point is they haven't learned the lessons yet, have they? No. Because, I mean, <laughs> they still have team viewer or without like proper security. So let me, let, let, let me ask you this question, Neil. I've asked you it's kind of the same thing before. When companies implement security, do they do it properly or is it like this, just a joke? It, it, I mean, it's it's that's such a hard question to answer. It's a great question. It is, it's yeah. just a, it's Very a hard, hard question to answer. I don't. So so let's take the water treatment facility plant. Right. Users will always do what's least impactful yeah. for their day to day work. You've seen this on the networking side, I'm sure. Right. When always. you when, always. Right. Um, and security is no different. Path, path of least resistance. Path of least resistance. I, I can't get access to the network. I'll just go on to the Wi-Fi or I'll go to a different network jack or whatever the case is, right? Um, it's like security versus ease or um, <laughs> what's the right term? Is it, um, is it I, will, I will always do what's more comfortable yeah. even if it affects my security. Even if it affects my security. And, and you, you, we'll, we'll never train that out of users. No. Right. We'll never train human that nature. Out of human nature. Human nature. You, you know, and, and here's what I would challenge anybody who watches this video. Really ask yourself, are you the perfect example of security? Do you legitimately have a unique password for literally every single account that you log into? Right. Some of you may say yes. Some of you may say no. Right. Are you legitimately doing two factor authentication literally everywhere that you, you're supposed to? Right. Really evaluate yourself. And be honest with yourself, you'll probably find that you're not the model, you know, cybersecurity person that you think you are in your day to day life. And, that's and, it, and it gets worse because if you've got <laughs> a wife and kids and they're not technical, <laughs> you know, and, 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 and that's a very good example. It's like, what do you do? You can't just like walk into your wife and you'd be like, enable multi-factor authentication because like that's how you get in the doghouse real quick. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's like, so, I mean, just taking this a step further, I mean, if you as a, a technical person who understands some of the risk, don't implement what you should, how is it, how do you communicate that to a business where, where it's full of people? So, Neil, you've got a lot of experience in businesses. How do you get across this message to the CEO, all the, you know, all those, the, the guys in charge, how do you get the message across to do what's not comfortable? This is going to be, this is probably going to be hashtag unpopular opinion, you know, for folks who watch this video, but it's a pragmatic approach to cybersecurity. And, and I go back to like our SOC analyst, right? Who's trying to make a decision on the glass as a witch alert to look, right? Put yourself in that technical role. And let's say you've got two vulnerabilities, right? Two um, CVSS, common vulnerability scoring system, 10 vulnerabilities, 
right? You got two CVS 10 vulnerabilities that just released today, right? On one hand, you've got, it's, it's a CVS S10, which means that it could be the potential to be really bad, but there's no publicly available exploit code. There's no signs of it being exploited in the wild, right? For all intents and purposes, it's more of a theory vulnerability than it is anything else. And then you've got another vulnerability over here that is the exact same severity, but there is publicly available exploit code on GitHub. It's in Metasploit, right? You know, it's being exploited in the wild by all the common exploit kits and the, the ransomware kits. Which one do you patch first? And everybody's instantaneous response in this industry is, well, you patch both of them. They're both CVSS 10. And that's the problem that we have in security is that we don't take a pragmatic approach to security because you can't tell the IT organization to patch both. They don't have the bandwidth to patch both. And you, the first part of that is recognizing in your own, being real with yourself, when you think about your own life, it's not real for you to walk into your living room and tell your wife that, you know, she must have 80 different passwords for her social media accounts, <laughs> right? And multi-factor authentication, that's the same thing that's not going to fly in a company or organization. And so you have to be realistic in those conversations and you have to say, okay, um, okay, I really want you to patch both, but if you have to, if you, if you can only patch one, please patch this one today and let's put this one on a path to get patched. Can we do it in the next 30 days? You become incredible negotiators in a cybersecurity organization because what you really want is you want them to patch this one today because you don't want to deal with this incident tomorrow. You don't want to have this breach conversation. You don't want to be up for the next 36 hours dealing with an incident, right? So you want this one to get patched today. This one, until there's a publicly available exploit code, until it's being exploited in the wild, yeah, it's a CVSS 10, but you could probably wait 30 days. And so I think the key is, is again, training ourselves that there is risk acceptance and there is risk tolerance inside of an organization um, that is a skill that is not taught to cybersecurity professionals in any of the stuff that we teach in any certification program out there. So, I mean, how do you learn that stuff? Um, <laughs> I, 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 la I laugh because I'm, I'm over here like, yeah, no, I don't think I got a book on that one. Um, you'll have to, you'll have to talk to your, you'll have to talk to like people at INE or, or, you know, some of the, some of the guys, you know, to create some content around that. We, you, you, it's you hard, you know, it is hard. It is hard. And, and you, you don't, that's a, that's a trial by fire. I hate to say it like that, but you know, I, I think. I think if you were to talk to, if you were to poll most of your viewers, right, and, and the new folks versus the experienced folks, you know, I know that for me, when I first got out of the Air Force in 2013 um, and went into my first company, I was, I want every vulnerability patched. If it's a CVSS 10, <laughs> I want every CVSS 10 patched. And I'd spent 10 years in the Air Force, right? And I was like, there is no way that I'm walking into a private company, like, I had spent, you know, we talk about stories from from my days in 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 you know cyber cyber command, you know, Syria, India, Pakistan, right, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait. Like finding Windows XPs in in those environments is second nature, right? You will find them every which way to Sunday. Finding Android, you know, cell phones that have some of the first versions of the Android operating system to do cell phone hacking, common commonplace in in, in a lot of those countries, just because they can't. They don't have the infrastructure to support. They can't afford the license cost to stay up to date on Windows 10, you know, you know, throughout. Um, when I got out of the Air Force in 2013, I was like, there's no way that a billion dollar company can't replace all their Windows XP machines with with whatever the latest was. Right. Um, and so uh, um, when I saw that, I was like, no, no, we can't have Windows XP running the largest financial backbone in the United States of America. That's just unacceptable. Um, and so I think you always start with these eyes that say we're going to solve every security problem by getting rid of bad passwords and enforcing MFA and updating all of our software. And you realize that that banks still use AS 400s that don't support anything larger than eight character passwords and they can't do they barely do uppercase. They can't do special symbols. Right. I was part of a you, you were I know this is teed up as one of your questions. But I was part of a, uh, an organization, it was a Fortune 100 company. They had a manufacturing line that literally does $10 billion a day worth of, of, of revenue for them on the manufacturing line. The very first computer 
on that manufacturing line runs Windows NT. And if that computer goes down, it is $10 billion a day that's gone that's solely dependent on a Windows NT computer. And, and that's, in t that's today. That's not five that's, years ago. Is no, it? that's today. That's well. today. And, and so you have to realize that businesses accept risk. There is financial acceptance to risk. And I'll tell this last story, but I see you want to ask a question. The first company that I worked at when I got out of the Air Force was a financial company, and they had just suffered one of the largest um, credit card breaches, you know, to date when I, when I joined them. Um, I was privy to a terrible conversation at some of the upper levels of management where they had actually contemplated that it was cheaper for them to pay the fines than it was to build a cybersecurity organization. Yeah, I mean, it's. You, I think when you when you knew in life, you want to do the best, but the older you get, the more jaded you get, and you re <laughs> <laughs> and you realize that it's um, the world is it, it's it's not black and white always. It's it's a, it's a lot of a lot of different shades of gray. If you like, it's a, it's a it's a lot of give and take. Um, well, but I, I think I, I think the only thing that I would say is like. When you do get older, you get jaded. But I think when you're younger, if you look at like a like a, a speedometer, right, zero to to a hundred, right, everybody wants to jump in the sports car and go to a hundred, right. And I think the longer you're in cyber and the longer you you're in this game, I think you quickly realize that um, even though the speedometer says it can go to a hundred, you're lucky if you can get it over thirty or forty miles an hour. I mean, because organizations are so slow to adapt. Is that what you mean? It is. It is. And 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 organizations are. And I don't mean to sound all doom and gloom, right? I've I've made a I've made a career as a. It's as, reality. It's reality. It is. It is. And so what you, you know, one of the things that I've had to adopt in my career, right, is I'm going to go into an organization and I'm going to build the best damn cybersecurity program that I can in an organization, and I'm going to take it as far as that organization organically will allow it to go. And there's a lot of organizations that are super receptive and they'll let you, excuse me, they'll let you move pretty fast to a point. But then at the end of that point, they start to get into that organizational mentality. They start to move really slow. They start to throw roadblocks in front of you. And that's the natural progression of where you can take most cybersecurity organizations. Um, and then I start to look for, you know, I, I said, okay, this is what your risk tolerance is for cybersecurity. And I start to look for other organizations where, you know, I can go make that impact because, you know, you could you can run really fast and you can hit a plateau just like when you're working out or anything else like that. And then you can stay there for 20 years and you might have gone from super accelerated to gradual improvement over the next 20 years. Um, and, and that's most what most people's cybersecurity career in an organization looks like.